welcome everyone if you're watching this now on twitch welcome being here and if you are watching this later on youtube then thank you for watching it on youtube as well um and thank you guys for subscribing actually i'm up to 225 youtube subscribers never thought that that would be possible by just recording live streams and putting them on YouTube but thank you so much um, so for today we have three very different topics and I just decided to smash them into one um, because we have uh, three hours anyway um, so the overview for today is first we will do camera trap image analysis and that will be presented by our guest speaker Aimé Freiberg. Um, Aimé is a former bachelor student of mine and she now is at the University of Bern. Um, so she will be talking about her master project. So um, ask a lot of questions um, because that just makes it more fun for her as well. So let me move then to the Gliederung for today. So um, camera trap image analysis. I will be talking about standards for analysis. And then in the end, the third hour will be me teaching you guys how to make an R package. Um, I have two more announcements to make um, the first one is the 17th of February there will be the exam so this date is final I actually have a second date as well um, which will be on the 7th of April um, I think the first date is an Agnes the second date is not fixed yet so I also don't think that that's an Agnes yet um, and besides that, I have to do a mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, because last week I forgot to upload the assignments. Um, that was stupid of me to not upload them. I am sorry. I'm really, really sorry. So to make up for you guys, this week there will be no assignment, but it will be the assignment of last week. So in the end, you win some, you lose some, um, but um, it just means that the lecture for today will not come with any assignments. Good. So I'm really sorry about that. I don't think anyone noticed because I didn't get an email saying, where are the assignments? Um, or people just thought, no assignments, woohoo, which is also fine. Um, but yeah, please do the assignments or at least look at them and uh, then we'll be good. All right, so our invited speaker. So let me actually put Aimee on. So hello, Aimee, welcome, welcome. Let me also show <laughs> your presentation. Hi. And then the floor is yours. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll move you up so, a little bit. Oh, yeah. I will move you up a little bit. Okay, you do your thing on the stream and I'll just do my presentation. Good. Um, so, uh, just before, if you have any question or something, you can write them in the chat. I'll try to read it, but I think my internet is lagging a little bit, so I might read it later. But any questions are welcome. Um, I'm going to present to you my master thesis, where I decided to do camera trap image analysis using machine learning. <clears throat> and what that exactly means, uh, I will explain to you. So next slide. Uh, before, Danny already said a little bit, but uh, currently I'm doing a bioinformatics and computational biology masters at BAM. Um, and before that, I did my biology bachelor's uh, at the Humboldt University, where Danny taught me how to code and where I decided I want to do more programming because it's a lot of fun. And I finished up all my exams, and now the only thing left is my master thesis, and I kind of am doing it in the topic on uh, conservation ecology. Next, please. Um, the grand picture of the project is that we have uh, kind of like a partner in Central Africa, which um, does his project, who does his project in the Chinko Nature Reserve. And the goal there is to do environmental conversation. And uh, by that, I mean that we want to uh, detect which species are there, how many of which species are there, and what their habits are. So um, where in which habitats are they? When do they sleep? When do they eat? Do they occur in groups? These kind of habits are uh, overall pretty difficult to detect because when humans are there, animals are not going to come out and do their normal thing. 
but especially in conservation, we're always interested in the shy species, so the species that are really hard to detect and the species that are super rare, because these are the ones we need to um, conserve the most. And to conserve something, we need to know uh, what's missing or how to help the animal. Um, very special in this uh, reservation, which will be uh, interesting later in the image analysis, is that it has very different landscapes. So we have a little bit of jungle, we have a little bit of savanna, we have wetlands. So we have all types of habitats that are possible, which means that also the images will be very different from each other, even though the reserve isn't actually that big. Next, please. <laughs> um, so before I talk about all the technical stuff, you might not know what a camera trap is. A camera trap is pretty much um, just this little box where a camera is in there. And there are different techniques on how it takes images, but ours is just a motion sensor. So any time something moves by it, it will take a series of 10 images and save those. And we have around 100 cameras, cameras in the reservation, and uh, there are different locations. We have the coordinates of them, and they just drive out, set them up, and then they leave them alone for about six months, because that's how long the batteries last. <laughs> and when the batteries are dying, we pick them up again, and then we wait until next year. And this, these six months, we call it around the season, and we produce around 100,000 to 200,000 images per season, which you can imagine is a lot of images and a lot of data for a person to look through every year. Next, please. <laughs> Um, this is one of the images that we take, so you can see there is an animal on there. Um, it's daytime, it's in the jungle, but it's a little bit camouflaged. Um, this is generally the type of images you get. Of course, there are different backgrounds, different habitats, different animals. Also, overall for this presentation, sometimes the images are going to be super hard to like see some things on them, so having maximum brightness on your desktop will be helpful for some part of this presentation. Um, okay, next, please. Yeah, this is just another one. This is a nighttime picture, same camera, same location, just a little different animal, just so you see uh, what we all capture. Next one. Uh, sorry, oh God. I just covered my own notes. Um, <laughs> That's fine, that's fine. This is a technical difficulty. Now I just... Uh, I, I want to be small again. I can't be small. Uh, uh, okay. Um, so the overall... I'm really sorry. This is... Uh, Sound sorry wise, you're a little bit... It put me in grid mode and now all my notes are covered and I can't see it anymore. <laughs> I can't remove it. Um, but I'm going to read from, my, from the side, but I might look to the left now, sorry. Um, I don't know what I did. I can just flip you if you want. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I can't look at my, Okay, so um, this is a super big project that I'm working on, and I'm not the only one that's working on it. Um, I'm just, you know, a little uh, wheel of the whole machine. But the overall idea of what I am doing to analyze these images to uh, reduce work of effort and financial strain. Um, by that I mean is that theoretically at the moment we would have to hire someone uh, full time to look at these images. Just all day, every day, look at these images and tell us what's on them. And it's a pretty simple task for people, um, but for computers it's a difficult task, but uh, overall this is very expensive to hire a person full-time just to look at images. Um, so that's why we kind of want to reduce the effort to actually get the data out of these images, uh, which we can do by automating the process and having the computer do most of the work for us, or even just like part of the work um, that's the most tedious. And for this, I plan to make a pipeline, so have different steps after each other to analyze these images and use uh, several different machine learning models to, that have different functions to do so. And the future best hope would be that these models could be loaded onto the camera traps themselves and then the images could be 
analyzed real time and the data could be sent real time so we have real time information of what is happening in this reserve without having to be there because now we still have the analyzed images from about six years ago and you know time is very urgent with actually doing something and seeing if measures work so having current data on what is happening right now is pretty crucial to actually do something efficient so that is the best hope for the goal of this project and we'll see if or when or how we can achieve it yeah next one oh, doesn't change i mean one second i'm just gonna retry myself oh god i've never used skype okay um so the overall question is uh, how we can deal with such large amounts of complex data because overall the task seems really easy for people but it's actually a pretty difficult task for computers next please um, so we have the usual analysis of data which is that you have your normal data and then you say what your computer should do with it for example you tell it to calculate the median of your data so you tell it, I give you the data and you have to do this, and then the computer tells you what the medium is. So it gives you the result. And machine learning has a little bit of a different setup. Next, please. I switched it. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I have to look at the stream and it lags. Yeah, oh. I know. There's like a two to three second lag, which is always a little bit annoying. Um, so <clears throat> with machine learning is that we give it the data, for example, the image as you saw before with the bird on it, and we tell it that there is a bird on it. So we already give it the result. And when we give those two informations to the computer, it has the task to learn on how to figure out to get the right result. So we're not telling it you have to do ABC to achieve this result. Uh, we're telling it, uh, I will tell you what the answer has to be, and you have to figure out how to get this answer correctly. So that's uh, what we mean with like machine learning and all that stuff. So it has to learn how to get the correct answer. This is just an overview of a neural network. I'm not expecting you to completely understand this or have to, you know, uh, explain this to anyone else. I just wanted to use you to see it once. Um, we have these little dots, which we call nodes. So you can uh, equate it to kind of neurons in your brain and they're connected to each other. And there are three main parts of a neural network. There's the input layer and you have all these different nodes in the input layer. And you can, you have, for example, when you put an image into your neural network, the, each node will get one pixel. So you have a certain amount of pixel, and those are the number of input nodes that you will get. Um, then you have the hidden layers, and these are the layers where the neural network uh, will adjust things and kind of test out and learn how it can get the right results. And this is kind of something where you have no result. The computer will do this himself or themselves. It's uh, neutral. <laughs> um, and which is, uh, I guess, a plus because you have to do less, but also a minus because you have no control over what is happening. And even if it's working well, you don't really know what happened to make it work that well. Um, but generally, uh, this we call the hidden layers because you have no influence and you, you do nothing. You can decide on what the layers are, but you cannot decide on what is happening within them. And the last layer is called the output layer. So that's your result you get. And for example, you have the result option, the image is empty, you have an animal, and you have a car and you have a house. So those are four options. Then you would have four output nodes. That's the general outlay of uh, a neural network. Next, please. <laughs> uh, of course, there are different type of neural networks and the one we use for images are called convolutional neural networks and with these we have the standard input layer and we have a convolutional layer and what that means is that we will convolute the image so we will put a filter on it um, a filter is useful because it can highlight things that you generally wouldn't see that well for example you can put on a filter that um, highlights the edges so 
For example, when something goes from really bright to really dark, there's some, usually like an edge between them. If you put a certain filter on it, you can highlight that edge. And sometimes this is information that's really interesting. And there are many, many different filters that can be used. And this is kind of what the computer figures out. It's like, oh, which filter do I have to put on to see the differences that I need to see? That's what the convolutional layer does. And it is always paired with a cooling layer which is that just that we merge pixels together. And then uh, you can repeat this. So you always put uh, the convolutional layer and one cooling layer together. And of this double layer, you can have one, two, three. Uh, yeah, three is a pretty common number, but you can have even more. And the more you have, the deeper your network will get. And then you have a few other layers, which are pretty common to other types of analysis, not just images and your standard output layer. But this is the special part about uh, images. Yeah, that we put filters on them. Uh, of course, um, I always talk about machine learning and the question is, okay, what is exactly learning or what do we need to do? So to learn, we have to train it. And we have a full data set and we call a full data set um, the data that we have labeled. So the data that we have information on that somebody has looked at. For example, before we had the image with the bird and I give it the image and I tell it it's a bird. So this uh, would be called labeled data. And we have this full data set and we take only part of it as a training set and part of it as a testing set because we always want to have uh, some like some data left to see how well is my network actually doing? Is it, if I give it random data, it hasn't seen before on a random app, but I give, if I give it similar data, but it hasn't trained on it, will it still do well? That's why we need to keep back a testing set to have a, to see the performance. There's something also called a validation set, which is part of the training set. And uh, it's linked to something that happens a lot in machine learning, which is called overfitting. If you've ever um, done some things with statistics, you know you have like this graph with the random dots and you have the options to either um, connect all the dots with a line to make like a squiggly line or you could make a straight line through them which might not get all the lines but it would have like uh, on average it would be between all the lines pretty well. So you make like a linear fit. Um, and the squiggly line will work best with the training data because you have perfect, you get all the points, that's perfect. But if you would add more dots that are not within the data that you've trained on, it might be worse than just putting a straight line through it. So if we have perfect fit, it might do worse on data it hasn't seen before. And that's why we try to avoid overfitting. Data. So we want it to do well, but we don't want it to just be like, oh, I know this training set perfectly, but anything that isn't exactly what I've trained on, I will not be able to do because I'm too focused on just my training data. Um, and on the graph on the right, you can see that we see how strong it's overfitting with the validation set. Yeah, please, next. Okay, um, with all the models, there are many different ones and it's a topic that is uh, rapidly evolving. Even if you have done, done something two years ago, you might want to redo it today because there are more models um, that currently are improving. So the current top one accuracy is around 90.88% of the best model and top one accuracy is um, if you show it the bird image and it tells you the first guess, my best guess is a bird, it does that with 9.88% accuracy. Uh, and the top five accuracy is the top five guesses. So somewhere in the top five guesses that my network will give me, it will have the right answer in there 98.8% of the time. Just to show you how strongly uh, networks are developing, even in the last years, that the 12 best neural networks have just been uh, released in the last year. So even, as I said, two years ago, these networks, you pretty much don't use them 
much anymore because there are so many new ones that we can implement that just have better performance. Um, of course, all of these models have been used on like a standard image set. They're pretty simple images of like a shirt or a face or something. Um, and they're generally a lot easier than camera trap images, which uh, you saw it has a lot of leaves. Animals are kind of camouflaged. They're not always straight in the middle. And, but the best results we get with machine learning on camera trap images analysis is around 86%. And just so you have a reference, humans get around 96% accuracy. Like if you train a volunteer, they will get around 96% accuracy. So this is what we're trying to achieve. So we're around 10% away from what we want to get. <laughs> um, so the question is, why are we missing these 10%? And there are many reasons why machine learning models uh, have difficulties. And one of the big ones is that animals are often camouflaged and hard to detect. And I gave an example image. And here you can see, wait, it hasn't shown up for me yet. <laughs> uh, here you can see, I can't even see another image, but here you can see the animal in the back. I think it's a small deer. And it's pretty similar to the background. So I have it on my left, pretty small. And if I wouldn't know, uh, um, I think it's a miniature deer. That's what it's called. I think the animal's here, right? Yes. This, this little black spot <laughs> in the background. So you see, if you don't, as I said, put your um, computer up to full brightness, it might help you to detect the little deer. Um, but this is often what we're dealing with, especially these twilight moments where um, the night camera hasn't really activated, but the daylight is also pretty weak. That's when these animals really blend in. And um, we humans have difficulties, and the computer has kind of the same difficulty of detecting this animal. Next. Uh, yeah. um, it's also that sometimes animals walk right in front of the camera, and sometimes they're really nice in the center, and sometimes they're super far in the back. Um, as you can see in the next picture, <laughs> yeah, you have these two antelopes, and the one you can see is kind of on the side and in the back, and the other one is nice, straight in the middle. Um, so the computer has to understand that this is also the same animal, that size is not really the same, and the color is somehow not the same, but it's kind of the same species. And um, so even doing the same thing doesn't work on all images because the images themselves, even though the same thing is depicted, is, can be very different. And this is a task that the computer also has to overcome. Next. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes uh, animals are pretty quick. <laughs> and we take 10 images of each animal. So sometimes there might be a motion detection and in two of the 10 anima images, the animals is just like with a tail or sometimes just a snout or it's really at the bottom of the image. Or as you can see on the picture that I provided, the animal is just super close. You know, it's kind of blurry. I don't know. It looks like some kind of antelope. Uh, if it has some kind of coloring that would uh, differentiate it from other antelopes, I don't know. Um, what the exact size is, it's really hard to determine. So the question is how even if like a person was like, I wouldn't be able to get this exact species, um, how would the computer distinguish it? Yeah, so um, these problems we also have. But as I said before, day and night images are also really um, different. And I show one uh, with the same uh, background. So this is the exact same camera, just day and night. And it also highlights really different things. So there you can see the light in the front and on the um, night images, you can kind of see the trees much more. Um, and also with animals, they look pretty different day and night. So if you try to, and the day and night, uh, the night images, especially also are black and white or grayscale. So we can't depend on just knowing, uh, using color differences within animal species to distinguish them. Mm. Also, animals often occur in groups, <laughs> and sometimes they're right behind each other, or um, they're 10 in a row, and sometimes you only see one horn, and even for uh, uh, you personally, sometimes I know an image where there was like a large herd of um, bison, 
or something and they were just like it was just pretty much legs it was pretty like 30 legs and i don't know how many belong to uh, actual animals or full animals so it was pretty hard and in the image after you can see these two pigs that walk behind each other and for us this one is pretty easy to distinguish but the computer could just think it's like a pretty long pig <laughs> that's the it's just a really long pig so it has, sometimes has a hard time to say um if animals are overlapping uh if that's one or two animals yeah. and we have something um that's also happening, which is uh, especially in our uh, image, uh, especially in our images, this is a big problem, which is called background bias. I'm going to explain to you in the images. So somebody made a test and they kind of wanted to see what does the uh, machine learning model look at. And red is what it really focuses on and blue is what it doesn't really care about. <laughs> and as you can see, it really cares about the trees in the back and it really doesn't care about the animal and, and computers are not that smart they have this big picture and they're like i don't know what to look at i don't know what's interesting in this picture i will focus in on the animal and like of course this is interesting to me but the computer doesn't know pretty much each pixel could hold in the beginning equal value and <clears throat> there's so we have um, yeah, no, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> You're too fast. Sorry. Um, so we have images with different backgrounds. For example, here we have um, a little bit of uh, grass and a little bit of trees in the background. And sometimes we have jungle, as you saw before. And some animals occur in some habitats much more than others. For example, you will rarely see a zebra in the jungle. Um, and you will rarely see specific type of monkeys in the savannah or in the desert. So the computer might learn, oh, anytime I have this background, there's a zebra or like 80% of the time. So it's going to learn, okay, this background mean, means that there's a zebra on there, which is, of course, not what we want to learn. Or it, it, sometimes it thinks like, oh, this tree, there's a giraffe on the image, but it's the tree that's the giraffe and there might be a different picture that has uh, some other animal on it and it's like, oh, the trees on there, that's a giraffe. And that's what we call background bias. It learns the background um, based on the results, but it's not looking at the images themselves. It bases the results on the um, environment. And this happens a lot, as you can see here. This could be like, okay, theoretically, there's an antelope on there and I see trees. So any time, time these trees are there, that's an antelope. And that, of course, is not the case. <laughs> Next one. Yeah, so here you can uh, see as well, you have the same, uh, you have the exact same background, two different types of animals. And But if we see one of the animals much more than the other one, it might think, okay, this is the identical background. It's always this one animal. Um, and we really want to avoid this because this is one of the main problems we're actually facing. Next one, please. <laughs> Um, yeah, there are also the problem which people have as well, that species are super similar. That maybe they're not really different in shape, but the only difference that they have might be in some color. Like some birds, they might have different chest colors, but the overall shape and size is super um, similar. So the question is, how could we differentiate these birds with night images, which just have grayscale? Um, so, Sometimes it might not even be possible, even for people. So uh, that's also a problem that we have. And the biggest problem that there is, which is uh, the whole reason why we're trying to get computers to solve it, is that we don't have enough training data. So we don't have enough images that have the labels on them. And to train machine learning models, you need a lot of labels. Uh, we currently are working with around 124 gigabytes of labeled data, and that's, uh, I think, 100,000 to like 150,000 images, and somebody had to look at them all. And especially if you're in a small project and you don't have a lot of people working on it, 
Um, doing this type of work is really difficult. And the really big models that are currently happening, I think they're even trained with like half a million images or something. And that make, makes it super difficult to train a good model if you don't have the training data. And it's kind of a conundrum because you want to train the model to not have to look at the images, but to train the model well, you will have to look at a lot of images. So, yeah, there are also some things, uh, some models that are trying to work on solving this problem as well to need less training data. Next, please. Okay. Um, so I started my project and I was thinking about uh, what do I want to do and I, what do I need to do to do this, uh, to classify um, these animals. And there are essentially two tasks to classify an animal, which is one is seeing if there is an animal or not. And the other one is, okay, if there's an animal, what is the animal? And the first step we do is just making camera trap images smaller because having smaller size just makes things usually run faster. And for example, I'm trying to currently do a test with about like these 100 gigabyte images and I calculated it's going to take me about uh, 12 days. So the, the less um, size, like the smaller the size, the faster your program is going to run. So you really want to uh, be as time efficient as possible because it's going to overall already take you a long time. Then the second task was to uh, see if there is an animal or not. And there I had two options. One is called Animal Spotter and the second one is called Mega Detector. Animal Spotter is a program that is a statistical pro program that runs with Markov chain models, if you've ever heard of it. Um, and Mega Detector is a machine learning model, so uh, a neural network. So uh, Markov chain is also machine learning, but Mega Detector is a neural network. And I wanted to see which one is better. And by the way, if you're interested in this at all, Mega Detector is made by Google, and you can just download it for, like, on your own laptop. It takes about if you know how to use the terminal, it will take you about 10 minutes to set up. So if you want to analyze your own images with Mega Detector, it's pretty easy. <laughs> um, and I did some tests with Mega Detector, and I found it to be uh, a lot better, much, much faster. I think the next slide I prepared should show us this. Yes. So um, Mega Detector was much, much faster than the other program. Um, it has around, it, one time I did a test and the other program, Animal Spotter, took around seven hours and Animal and Mega Detector took around 1.5 hours. So um, a lot less time, which is really important when you have to do a lot of images. <clears throat> and even though I resized the images, uh, it didn't really make sense, make any difference for the mega detector program, but for the other program, it was uh, much faster. Um, and I also checked uh, how good actually is the mega detector because it's a model that wasn't trained by me, so it was, was trained by Google on all kinds of images. And mega detector has the options that it can detect empty images, but also different categories and what could be on them. And I will get into this in a second. But um, what I found is that it's really good at seeing if an image is empty. So the more empty images you have, the higher your accuracy is going to be. And in the 92% accuracy I had when around 30 percent of the images had animals on there and the 99.8 percent accuracy I had when I think 0.04 percent of the images actually had animals on them. And with this you also see, for example, if an animal, if a person looks through it and wants to see if there's an animal on it, how much kind of unnecessary work they do. So if only 0.04% of the images actually have animals, then the question is why do we have to look at the other ones as well? So even just using that one step could make your whole process a lot faster. <clears throat> of course, uh, we're also missing a few percent. So the question is what kind of mistakes uh, does it do? 
and it always does the same mistakes as I showed you before uh, in the beginning the, the little deer that was super hard to detect the model really struggles with that as well it's pretty much as bad as we are with this <laughs> um, and there are always options that we can retrain models so I could say okay the model is pretty good but I want to retrain part of it so it's really specified to our problem so there are still options to improve the model if I want to have higher accuracy, but that's something I just didn't get to yet. We'll see how it goes when I finish up, and if I think, oh, I need to tweak some things, I might go back to this model and just try to improve it. A uh, huge advantage of the mega detector is that it uh, tells you what was found. So we have the options that it finds uh, empty images, it finds animals, or it finds humans, or it finds finds vehicles. Vehicles in this moment is not really that interesting for us, but uh, detecting animal, uh, animals and humans is really what we're interested in because uh, there are a lot of privacy laws and a lot of, maybe not in our case, but for example in Switzerland, we try to um, monitor links and a lot of these cameras are located on hiking trails. And of course we can't just like blast these images of people everywhere because that's just against the law. So if we, um, because this detector gives us the category, we can just filter out anything that is not an animal. So we can, um, this is important for us. And also it gives us less work to do um, because we're very specific on what images we want to look at and what images we just don't care about. Um, after that, it also gives us the confidence level of uh, what it has detected. So it tells us, I found something, but it might not be sure at all. So it says, like, okay, I found something and I think it's an animal, but I'm 10% sure. Or it's like, okay, it's 100% an animal, no doubt. And this is important because uh, under a certain confidence threshold, it's not that good. I would say if it has 10% confidence in what it found, I wouldn't trusted. And with this, we don't have to take everything it gives us, but we can find out uh, how sure does the model have to be for us to actually trust it. And we can filter by that. And the last one is that it um, doesn't just tell us uh, that it found an animal, but also where it found it, and it draws a little rectangle on it, which is really nice. And we also can use this rectangle to just cut out the animal, which will come handy later. But, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> yeah, so here you can see the little animal. And uh, this is pretty much, uh, if we visualize the output of the mega detector, this is what we get. So we get the little face. And we have a little red square around it, which is uh, the color for animals. And then it's written, I think, that there is an animal on there. And there, it's super sure it says it's 100% accuracy. It's 100% sure that this is an animal looking into the camera trap. Um, but just so you can see what the detector actually does with the images. <laughs> and I would say it's pretty good. It's pretty close, cutting it pretty close to the ears and also top of the ears. So it's not just, um, it doesn't have a lot of room around the animals or it doesn't cut anything off. So it's pretty good at actually precisely locating the animal itself. Next, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so I thought we were going to get a little bit interactive, have a little bit fun. Um, and the question is, are you better than Mega Detector? And we're going to say um, that we're going to look at the 92% accuracy images. And I just want you to uh, write down on which images you see an animal and on which images you think it's empty. And then after that, I'm going to tell you if there is an animal on there or not. And then you can see. So if out of 10 images, if you get 9 out of 10 right, you're approximately, like you're a little bit worse, but you can't achieve 92% since I didn't put that many images in there. But, um, yeah, so get a pen and paper good. ready. Like, just take a pen and paper. And um, how long did you want to show them the images? Yeah, so I will show the images for five seconds because that's how long the mega detector takes approximately per image. Good. So get so, a pen and paper ready. Just write like numbers one to ten already on your sheet of paper, right? And then you're just going to have in five seconds decide animal, yes or no, right? So, and I would suggest, as I said before, put it on maximum brightness because yeah. I 
sometimes it's kind of easy, but sometimes it's not easy at all. It, it is really hard. <laughs> it is really, really hard. <laughs> like... It's really hard. <laughs> and I gave you most of the, like, uh, some of the images I show you, the detector itself also got wrong. So... I wanted to make it difficult for you. <laughs> Good. So throw in chat if you're ready. Um, so just so that we know um, that at least one of the persons is doing it. Um, so um, <laughs> I guess Misha is the only one still listening. But um, just throw in chat when you have your pen and paper ready. I have my pen and paper ready, so I will be joining you guys. I haven't done it. Like I, I we quickly scrolled through it yesterday, um, but uh, I, I haven't classified them so I don't know either so I'll just have the numbers like one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten and um, all right we get it ready we get a haha -ha, perfectly fine all right so then we are going to start right and I'm just gonna you I when the first image I'm just gonna count to five and then we're gonna switch to the next one right that's how we're gonna yeah. do it good all right first image one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five one two no sorry one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. And we're done. Good. So how many images did have an animal on there? Yeah, how many did you see? <laughs> You missed you missed one image or you missed one animal. Just just tell us how like you think five. All right, so Misha thinks five. Any other guesses from the audience? Anyone else think they saw more or less? All right, Xanaxin says that she thinks she saw three. Mm. All right. All right, and Bacon, you you were doing it as well. How many did you think you saw? Nothing, nothing. It takes a little while, right? People have to type and people have to... Yeah, we're not in a hurry, I think. All right, Bacon also uh, thinks... Three, three animals. Three animals. I think I spotted more. I think I spotted more. I think I spotted like four or five or... I think I think Misha's closest, I think. Um, but I have a big screen, right? So that's, that's one of my yeah. advantages. All right, so take it away. Next slide, right? Yep, next slide has the answer on it. And... <laughs> it's seven. Seven images had animals on them. So, <laughs> yeah, some of them were super hard to detect. Um, I'm going to through, go through them again, and I made little red boxes around it. And if you didn't see it, don't worry. I really zoomed in and took my time to actually look at them. So don't stress that you didn't see it. <laughs> All right, this um, one was pretty easy. Like, yeah. It's a little bit hidden, but like the, the um, ears give it away. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I was like, oh, we're going to start with an okay one. It's not the easiest, but it's going to show it. But um, yeah, the next one I is going really slow. The next one was empty for me. Yeah, second one is empty. And then uh, the third one. Should also be empty, I think. Yeah, yeah <laughs> empty. That's true, that's true. Although I thought that in the middle here, this thing here, um, but it, it's probably just kind of an artifact, but uh, yeah, it I mean, looked like a big chicken, but like... that's actually pretty interesting because this is just a, a big root and this is something the, the model routinely thinks is an animal with 100% accuracy. It's very determined that this stupid root is an animal and all the mistakes it makes of thinking there is an animal where there isn't is because of this single root. <laughs> but it's the same what humans do. 
right? If yeah. you if you see a garden hose, the first thing that you think is snake. So yeah, that's kind of the the way. It but yeah, it's it's really convinced that um, yeah. this is this is a root. Yeah, I would have misclassified this one. All right, fourth one. Yeah, this one's super super sneaky. This one's super super sneaky because this one is super mean. It's in the bottom left and it's barely on there. But you can <laughs> see the little tail slinking around. Um, but this is actually something the model detected, so it did see it. I personally, for this one, I placed the little squares around it, but the model did detect it. So if you saw this, that's good. <laughs> This one I haven't seen at all. Like for me, this is just a black picture, even on like full brightness, like yeah. zooming in. Um, I actually thought about taking this one out of your presentation, putting it in paint and then just inverting the colors. <laughs> this oh, we have a question neat. from uh, from Misha actually. Uh, can you tell the code that if it's on the same position on all 10 pictures, it's not an animal? Um, well, the problem is that there is no code pretty much. You know, we, we, we don't really program anything. We, we make a model. That's kind of what the annoying thing about it is because we just give it the images and we give it the result. We don't tell it what to do. It does it itself. So that's kind of the, yeah, we can't, like we know it always does this wrong, uh, but we don't really, we can't reach into the code of the model itself. Yeah, so machine learning without code, yeah, yeah, in theory it is, right? You just have neurons yeah. that kind of see images and then they adjust themselves and then they give you an answer, right? So you, you can't go into the neuron and, and fix some things. Yeah, you can't adjust it. So it's pretty much, um, so generally the way it learns is, so you give it, for example, 10 images with the results. And the notes have some like preset. It's like, okay, we're just going to try random things in the beginning. And then it's going to go through the notes and then it's going to give out the result that a thing is happening. And then it's going to compare it to the results we gave it. And then it's like, oh no, I did really bad. I have to change something. And there are different techniques on how you see what you did wrong. But then after this, it's like, okay, I have to change what's happening in these notes. And this is actually the learning part. And that's how it knows if there's something or not. And as I said before, because I know these problems happen all the time and the model is not trained in our data, um, we have these, uh, all these we call hidden layers. And the upper layers are for the big, big things like the big outlines or big shapes. And the deeper layers are for the small details. And it is possible to not have to retrain the whole model, but just some layers. For example, I take two layers and retrain the details with my data. So it's like, okay, the general shape of animals is always the same. The, same. the general color of the animals are generally the same. But maybe um, the snap color is a little bit different or this, like a few pixels of difference. And this we can adjust by retraining. Uh, it's called retraining the deeper layers. That's what you call it. But um, this is how you can improve this problem, but you can't make these, there's not really code you can, um, you can adjust. The only thing you can do is train it and train it better. Yeah, that's how you um, get your model to be better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But or yeah, this one is for model. me, like it's black. Like, no code in the world is going to make this visible for me. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I looked at it on my computer. I did full zoom in, and there is. Uh, it's also a miniature deer that's on there. A lot of miniature deer in the area there. <laughs> yeah. All right. This one was easy. Next I time. think everyone like spotted this one. Right, like yeah. the, the, there's a porcupine, and like the eyes light up. I think that that's one of these telling giveaways. Is that like hey, because animals, especially in like these like nighttime pictures, um, you can see the eyes very clearly. Um, all right, the number seven. I didn't spot that one. It's a monkey, right? Monkey in the back. Uh, no, it's um, it's a bison. A what? Or a buffalo. It's, it's the hind legs of a buffalo, like it's the butt to All the right. back. It's a buffalo. All right. It's a buffalo butt. Yeah, but there you can see the good example of some animals are super hidden and they're in the background and they're pretty small and they're kind of similar color. Um, these are hard to see. Yeah. 
definitely. All right, <laughs> picture number eight was empty. Uh, oh, picture number nine. I didn't see that one either. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's also a miniature deer. <laughs> Just hiding in the bushes. Actually, I, in my first run, I didn't see it, but then I looked through the results of the mega detector, and only then did I see it. So. Isn't that overfitting? In a way, it, like the computer telling you there's an animal, and then you're going to kind of zoom in and look. Because in the end, <laughs> the, the original image was labeled as like no animal then by you. Well, um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, but you can see that there's an animal, especially if you compare it to other uh, images of the same type. Yeah, probably. Uh, image number 10, again, for me, it's just a big black image. Yeah, uh, even when I zoomed in, Honestly, this is like a 50-50. I might just be hallucinating that there's something on there, but I believe there's an antelope in the front. And you can see, I think, the front leg a little bit, and also the hind feet, the hoofs, you can see, kind of. But um, if you miss that, I can completely understand. <laughs> For me, it's just a black image. Like, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> don't see yeah. any of the resolution. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I just wanted to give you... Um... I see a red square. Yeah, there's definitely a red <laughs> square there, but that's not what we're detecting, so... Uh. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to see, um, to show you kind of what kind of images we deal with, and also the problems that people face with making labels. Because, of course, if we train a, a model, we want to... It ideally make it perfect, kind of get 100% accuracy. But like, how do you get 100% accuracy if the stuff you train it on is not 100% accurate? So these images, you're like, I don't know if there's something on there or not. I can't tell you. And uh, if I can't tell the machine what the answer is, the machine can't really give me the answer. I also can't check if it's right or wrong because I personally don't know. <laughs> so we see um, these are kind of struggles we face. So I hope you had a little bit of fun loosen it up today and now I'm going to continue with the super technical stuff of everything. Um, yeah, so uh, after we do the whole detection stuff, as I said before, we want to sort the images because um, sometimes there is 50% of the images have animals on them and sometimes only a really, really tiny part have animals on them and because the steps after we'll be categorizing the animals we don't really need an empty images we definitely don't want any humans on the images so we separate it and uh, if you imagine you have a hundred thousand images and only one percent actually has animals on them we have a lot, a lot less work in front of us so that's why we try to um, isolate only the animal images Next, please. Sorry, the lag is happening. Um, um, after this um, is where my kind of testing phase of my master thesis is coming in. So if we follow the middle line, which goes straight to the last box, that's calling uh, that's the training the image classification model. I'm going to go into it a little bit later on what it is and why I chose it. But um, the standard way of doing it is that you have your image, your full image, and you just give it to the model to train and analyze. Um, but as I said before, we, we face huge problems with background bias. Um, and one way I thought we could eliminate it is just to remove the background. And that's why Mega Detector is so handy because it makes a box around the animal, as you saw before, it does it pretty well. And we can just cut out the box um, with the animal in it. So we remove about like 80 or 90%, depending on how close the animal is to the camera, um, of the background, which makes the probability of um, background bias much lower is what I'm guessing. That's my estimation. So that's the, the lower pathway would be cutting out the animals with a rectangle and then training the image classification models on these cutout rectangles. And 
And there also have been other tests and it does seem to improve it. So I'm hoping that also with our case, um, especially because we have very many, many different and also very like obscure and a lot of leaves and things happening in the background and the stupid root, um, that it does a little bit better when we cut out the animals. Uh, and there could be a third step. So the question is, is cutting out the animals with just a rectangle enough? And we follow the upper path where we have um, cutting the animal out with a polygon. And the polygon is pretty much, you know, the exact outline of the animals. And V7 is a, also a neural network model. And it's really good at um, making precise outlines of animals. But it's not good at, do it, at doing it when um, the, the image is super big and there are a lot of things on it. So you kind of have to tell this model where the animal is approximately. And that's why I put the step of cutting out the animals with the rectangles before it. So Mega Detector will kind of make the overall analysis of the image where, to see, oh, this is where the animal is approximately. And then V7 will be like, OK, I can make the outline of this animal. And I personally am interested in uh, if cutting out the exact shape of the animal, so really having no background, is uh, helpful or is it a little bit of an overstep? Is having very little background with just the rectangle? Does it really, like, does the machine model really care? Or um, would cutting out the exact shape of the model be uh, a good step to do as well? Um, and I don't know what the answer is. I haven't gotten that far yet. As you can see, it's not implemented yet. <laughs> But um, that's kind of my path of my master thesis that I'm really interested in seeing like what steps can we do before so we can um, help the model be better. Maybe not improving the model itself, but making the things that the model has to do, these kind of hurdles it has to jump over, kind of removing some of the mess. Um, yeah, and the model I want to train is meta pseudo labels, and it's a little bit of a weird name. But uh, it will hopefully make sense in a second when I explain it to you and why I chose it. I think that's the next slide, if I'm yes. right. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, you can uh, ignore the image above for a second. I will get to it later. But the accuracy of meta pseudo labels with these, uh, not with camera trap images, but with these uh, a lot easier test images is 90.2% accuracy. As I said, the top accuracy that we currently have is 90.88%. So the question is, why do I not take the best model there is? Well, because models can become super, super big. And the size of the model is usually determined by parameters. And as I said, um, you have these little nodes and they adjust themselves to make like better filters. And within these nodes, you have these parameters. And the biggest or the best model has about 25 million of these parameters, which makes it a huge model. And this one is still pretty big, but it only has 5 million. And as I said in the very beginning, the ultimate dream goal is to load these models onto the camera traps themselves and um, onto the camera traps themselves and having real-time analysis of these images. But if you have huge models that are just too big to load on small mobile camera traps, then um, this is not possible. So you always have to keep in mind um, kind of the restrictions you have. And there was a question. Yep. Um, what improving... Uh, mm. What about improving on the sensor side, for example, mag adding microphone array. I don't really know what microphone array is. So I have a microphone, right? Animals make sounds. So yeah. you take 10 uh, photos and you record like a 10 second sound clip um, at the same time. In and addition. Like you, you see something which looks like an owl and you hear ooh -hoo on the, so use multiple um, data sources together. Yeah, I mean, uh, generally, I think this could be an idea, but so from where I'm sitting, I think like one, a lot of animals that we look at don't make sounds. Um, the miniature and maybe deer doesn't make a sound. 
like <laughs> most of the time they don't really make sounds not you can um um uh, not that so they don't uh, make that many sounds or not that often and the question is if an animal that's not on the camera but pretty close makes a sound um would that be linked to the wrong animal you know there's like you know it happens at the same time and you see uh, a deer in front of it but as you said there's an owl in the back and then we have the out sound at the same time as we have the deer on the image um, yeah so it might actually cause more confusion yeah it might be um, that because then everything sense. would be classified as a cricket because there's always cricket sounds in the yeah. background so, uh, but um, um, updating the um, um, updating the, the, the image so instead of using a certain megapixel just boost it by tenfold will that help or will that actually hurt because of course the images will start getting bigger, but the amount of detail on the images will of course be more. Um, contrary to popular belief, having better resolution images doesn't actually increase performance. Sometimes have re reducing the size of the images increases performance. Um, that might be counterintuitive, but often, uh, for example, the, the um, Animal spotter program I talked about in the beginning, it gets better even result wise when we have less pixel. So that's good to know good. for the UFO field. Like all of these shaky like cell phone <laughs> camera UFO pictures, that at least that's that's the right that's what we want to have. We don't want to have high definition pictures, we just want to have like shaky iPhone pictures. And uh yeah, um, I think what we could improve, I think with the cameras, the biggest problem is like this twilight zone because it, it, as a, these are the images nobody can detect because it's super dark, but the night mode hasn't turned on yet. So this sensor is really bad. And the problem the camera has is also that it kind of gets worse once the battery gets really low. Um, but I mean, getting new cameras, investing in new cameras, better cameras is a huge expense. So, and it won't solve and, you with the hundreds of thousands of images that you already have. Yeah. And overall kind of only ha having something that works with the best possible machines is kind of a very limiting success, you know, kind of, I would, I personally would see that, uh, the, like the better your your model performs, even though your data is bad, the better your model is because it's not feasible that every project has the best stuff there is. Um, did you ever think of building your own camera traps um, on basis of I don't know what our Arduino is? I'm it's sorry. like a Raspberry Pi. They're the like the little. Uh... Um, so I have nothing to do with the camera traps. This is a project that has been running for, I think, six years. And it's a guy that used to work with our university. Um, I don't know. I think they once invested in these cameras. I'm not, I don't see that they're going to change them very soon because I don't know how much camera traps actually, um, cost. <laughs> they're, they're probably not cheap. If they yeah. run for six months continuous, like um, they don't do Wi-Fi things, right? So the, the no. cameras are all stored on like an SD card on the camera. So yeah. someone has to fly I mean, there, get the SD card out, put a new one in, change the battery, and then... Yeah, I mean, all these things are theoretically possible, but that's not at all what my field is. My plan is I get data and whatever data is, I will try to do my best with, you know, of course these things are possible, increasing the camera traps, but mine is like, I will, I want to achieve the best possible result with what I was given. You know, it's, it's kind of like a cheap way out for me personally to say like, ah, I can't do it. Your camera trap wasn't good enough. You know, <laughs> my plan is even if your data is shitty, I want to be able to give you something that's reasonably good. And that's why I'm more focusing on the side of, what can I do with what I already have um, to improve what's happening? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I think that's a good answer. Um, Misha yeah. guesses that they're around 50 euros a piece. Okay. Well, we have 100 at least. So 10 to 100. <laughs> yeah. So that's like 5,000 euros of investment. Yeah. If they cost 50 euros, because I think that 50 euros is like 
pretty cheap for a camera trap. Mm -hmm. Like Yeah. So I'm just gonna go back to the model itself. Because I think I'm already over time. I'm just gonna explain this and then I'm gonna be almost done. Um so um Oh, you're Not you're okay with time. Like you can you can talk as long as you want. That that <laughs> like it doesn't matter to me. I I shortened already the whole presentation for myself today. So what, the the real stuff, right? Like this doesn't go to, on the exam. So it's like I think it's the nice extra for students. So if you want to talk for another thirty minutes, yeah. that's fine. Um, then we just do that, and we just kind of. I'm the... here for entertainment. Um, okay, so. <laughs> The meta pseudo labels is something um, that's not really a model in itself, but it's uh, two models. And we have mo one model that's called the teacher and one model that's called the student. And now you can uh, look at the little image that I have. And in the upper row, um, you can see that we have the teacher in yellow. And there we have the training data on the left of it. So the training data is the data that we have given labels to, that we know what's on there. We have written that there is a bird or an antelope or a tiny little deer. So this is the label data. And then we do the standard stuff. As I said before, we give the images and then we give the results to the model and then it learns. And once it learns, the steps come a little bit different. So then it produces something that's called pseudo labels. And there I made another slide, please. Uh, I, don't, I don't see it yet, but I'm just going to yeah, start talking. Yeah. So we have little, um, uh, for example, we have this image of a little dog. And on the left side, on the bottom, you can see human label data. So if I were to say what is on this image, I would say 100% it's a dog. So I'm fully certain. and. It's not at all a house, it's not at all a wolf, any other options are wrong, just 100% wrong, and this one option is 100% right. Um, but the pseudo-label data sees things a little bit different, and it's not just interesting on interested in if the answer is right, but kind of like how close it is to actually the real answer. For example, here you see that the right answer is still a dog with 99% certainty, but uh, a wolf is also kind of close, right? If we have the house and the flower and the wolf, anybody would agree that if you mistake the dog with something, if you mistake it with a wolf, you would be more correct than mistaking it with a flower. And that's kind of the idea that you kind of maybe like reward your model by saying, you're wrong, but you're also kind of close or you are also super far away. So it's not just like you either have wrong or right, but you also have a gradient in between. You were you detected something that was closer to the right answer than something else. And this is um, a little bit easier for it to learn. So that's why we call it pseudo-labels, and that's also why the model is called meta pseudo label data. And I think you have to go to those slide before again. This one. <laughs> Um, the yeah. Pseudo oh, yeah, this one. Okay, so the next one you see the pseudo labeled data, which means, um, and here comes the real benefit of this model. Pseudo labeled data is data that we give to the model, so images, but we haven't looked at it. So this is uh, any, any, so we have around two terabytes of data. And I could give around, like, I have 100 gigabyte of labeled data, and I could give an additional 600 gigabyte of unlabeled data, where this teacher model gives it pseudo labels. So as you see, we already have uh, 700 gigabytes of data we use for training in comparison to before, where we only had one gigabyte of training data. And as I said before, training data is often a limiting factor. So this is uh, one of the advantages of having this made up pseudo labels. Um, so this pseudo label data is then used to teach a student model. This is a different model, um, independent of the teacher model, and it's not trained on the label data that I have used or I have labeled, but uh, only the data that the computer has labeled. So these pseudo labels. And then the student learns and it makes a little bit of a test, you know, on the validation data. 
and then like you you will do an exam and then you will check your exam and check how good you did and there are several options and there's also the option of like oh no everybody failed i did horribly in teaching them so maybe you have to do some reflecting on how you actually teach and this is what the teacher model does so it teaches the student it gives the student a test and then it sees the results of the test and from then it decides on how to better learn itself to make better labels so it kind of updates its label data to get the student to perform better and this is a circle so the teacher learns it teaches the student the student uh, gives the results the teacher tries to be a better teacher and you know it goes round and round where eventually the student becomes better than the teacher um, and this is the overall idea and it might not sound like a groundbreaking concept but this is very new and it hasn't been uh, done before and it also has never been used on camera trap data so i actually don't know how it's going to perform um, but I hope, because it's supposed to be good on very diverse data and it only needs a little training data, um, and usually you need about 10% of labeled data compared to your unlabeled data. So we can, instead of uh, 100 gigabyte data, we can train with 10 times more data, which is a huge advantage. Um, and especially if we want to um, think about, you know, you kind of always want to think about the bigger picture maybe it's not just me who's using it maybe not our research group maybe we want to help uh, other programs that have very different habitats um, that they can also use a pipeline where they can train with their data even if they have very limited training data um, and this is why i chose it i'm currently still trying to work on it it has very specific requirements for the computer and how to install it I'll have to do a lot of adjustments. I haven't gotten to them yet. Um, but yeah, that's the goal. And then um, in the future, I will see how well it does. Um, and I hope it does well. And then, of course, there are all the adjustments we can do before. How well does it do with full images? How well does it do with cropped images? Um, and I will do all these tests in the scope of my thesis. And I hope it... Uh, produces something that's very usable for my group. As I said, we have two terabyte of images that uh, nobody has looked at and it's been just sitting there for six years. So if I can make something that they can use and they can finally have some data from this project that's been going on for so long, I will be super happy. <laughs> they will be yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> But uh, that's the ultimate goal. I don't know. Maybe I'll make a model that has like 50% accuracy and it's still trash. But I mean, that's also an experience. But um, overall, that's the plan. And I think, um, yeah, that was it, I think. Maybe. I don't know if there are more slides, but I think uh, that's There's done. another planned image pipeline thing. Ah, yeah. So oh, I yeah, think the, made up the last changed. overview that you can see yeah. <laughs> with the different pipelines. <laughs> So you're still working on two parts, right? The, yeah, the cutting I mean, out of the animals using the polygons, so to, to kind of remove all of the background. And then the, the next one is to the classification yeah. where you want to use this uh, pseudo labels. Yeah, I mean, logistically, getting the meta pseudo labels running is the most important step. So that's what I'm currently working on. And the, the V7 is kind of like a, you know, little cherry on top. Perfect. Um, because as soon as I get it running at all, like I could imagine like, okay, I give it just the images and suddenly it's super good. It's already at 97%. And it's the question like, why do we have to do all the steps in between? Or the cutting the rectangles is already super good or something. Or the rectangles, for example, are not better than giving the full image. And if the rectangles already aren't better than the full image, then it stands to question whether a polygon would be better than the full image. So it's still uh, up for debate um, what's happening. I guess I have to wait on the results, but running through these things with the sizes of the data I have can take like from between two weeks to maybe a month. So I have to be patient. <laughs> just training stuff um, with the amount of data that I use just takes a super long time. But yeah, that's uh, it for me. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I know this was very long. 
but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I guess you can ask them now or later. Um, to Danny, maybe you can answer some. Yeah, well, you can <laughs> hang around. Like, I can just hide you if I want. Um, like, I'm, like <laughs> or are you running out doing grocery shopping now? That that could be well, as well. That. Um, but yeah, if there's anyone having questions, um, ask them now. Or um, of course, yeah. there might be questions from the people watching it later on YouTube as well. Um, but then um, just mail them to me, um, and I will mail them to Ame, and if I if I can't yes. answer them. Um, I also use YouTube. I can just check out the video in a week or two and see if there's anything and answer the questions. That will be <laughs> that will be perfect as well. Um, all right. Um, but yes, I hope you had some interest and see why machine learning is maybe a more difficult thing than the media makes it out to be. <laughs> it's not a simple solution for everything. And yeah. So oh, there's a question actually. Um, why the differential priority and focus when analyzing pictures? Yeah. Random or given? I. What kind of priority do you mean? It's a Not difficult sure. question. Um. <laughs> Not sure. I get the question completely. Um, maybe. You Could you read... rephrase it, uh, Xanaxin? In a in, because I'm. Ah, okay, the models, oh, so the slides where you showed the bias the models had when analyzing the picture. So it's about the, uh, I think the background, right? Where, ah, yeah, the background. Uh, um, well, <laughs> I would say generally, um, uh, I mean, generally, you can say that computers aren't that smart. <laughs> and they just don't know what's happening. But it, um, it can be, for example, of course, we don't ever just give one image. And especially in camera traps, so there is camera trap images, you can think they're pretty much like all other images, but it's actually not true. Uh, because, for example, you have the image of me, I have a face, and then I have a background. And Danny has a face and a background. And for normal images, it's you know, you usually like, for example, a lot of people use Instagram images to train their models because you have a lot of images of the same stuff, but it's always a different background. And with us, we have kind of the opposite. We have the same background and different stuff on the background that we have. And it's kind of uh, sometimes uh, if we give the same label with the same background, it's going to look for consistencies within the background. Uh, or within the whole image. For example, if you, uh, as you saw the root before, for example, here, the trees are always the same. And it's just, so we say there are 10 images with the antelopes and it's always this one and the antelopes have always different positions, might be farther away, might be closer, but the trees in the background are always the same. And it's trying to find similarities between these to re-detect re it. And that's maybe why it focuses on things that are not the antelope themselves, but the background, because it's trying to find consistencies between them. That's why I think it's like focusing on other parts, um, because it's noticing that these are super similar between the images with the same labels. But uh, it might be also other reasons, you know? They're uh, that, machine. That's kind of what it does, right? Like it just looks at an image and then it learns a pattern. Like it sees hundreds yeah. of the same labels saying antelope, antelope, antelope. And it just looks at all of these images and tries to figure out what's the same in all of them, right? Yeah. And, and since the antelope is always slightly different, but the background is the same, it just kind of learns the background. And it was one of the questions that I had you say that most of your images are, uh, in many cases, empty. You, you talked about a certain point where you got the best accuracy when only like zero point something percent of your images had animals in there. Yeah. But is that not unfair in a way, right? Because if you show it, because um, let me see if I can find that slide quickly. Um, because you said that the more empty images, the higher the accuracy of the model, right? Yeah. And you ended up with an accuracy of 99.8%. But that was at the point where you said that only 0.04% of the images had animals on there. 
Yeah, I mean, but that's of course weird that. because then the accuracy should have been nine nine point nine six because just shouting empty for all of them, right, would have given you a better accuracy. Because just saying no, all of the pictures are empty in the end would give you a better accuracy in the model. And I think that that's one of these things where um, when I did machine learning in the past, I used random forest. I was always told that you should that the accuracy of the model is not that important. The thing yeah. which is important is the amount of correct classifications compared to um, the distribution of this in your training set. Right. Yeah. If you only I mean, have like one picture of a monkey, um, then of course this thing calling something a monkey is of course very, very unlikely. But if you have millions of pictures of monkeys, then of course it should be a lot better in detecting monkeys compared to something that you don't have a lot of pictures of. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just pretty much, I'm, not, I'm still at the kind of beginning of my thesis. And currently I was very limited by my computer. <laughs> which meant I could only do very small tests. And I just wanted to kind of get an overview of what is actually happening. You know, I was just doing quick tests. But currently, I'm running, a, um, I'm, I want to run a test on all labeled images we have, so 124 gigabytes, um, which I said were like 100 to 120,000 images. The maximum test I did was 800 images. So, and, but I sometimes, like, I want to do these pre-tests to just get an overview and not have something running for 11 days and then it's not good. Um, but with this, we're planning to actually make a confusion matrix, so um, to see how many of the images that had animals were actually detected as animals, how many animals did it miss, how many empty images did it think it had animals on them, and how many empty images. Um, actually were empty so it's really important to see what kind of mistakes were made but i couldn't give you info on the info on that yet because i just don't have the data do, do you run it all locally on your computer no okay. i have um that's from i have a university computer but um as i said i need a lot of um disk space and mine only had 100 gigabyte and I just couldn't do it. So I got a new university computer and now I have to reinstall everything and then I can run the test. All right. Um, if right. you want access, like you should have access to our server here still. Yeah, um, I'm trying to run the server. Um, we have a university server, but installing TensorFlow is a difficult thing, they told me. <laughs> All right, I can, so, I can, I can put it on my agenda. See if I can install TensorFlow on our server. Yeah, around. yeah. I mean, a lot of part of my master thesis and generally in programming is trying to get things to work, jumping that's, over that's, hurdles, that's having technical thing, problems. Yeah. Um, so it's not just writing the code. You also have to, yeah, have the dependencies that your programs need, have the right versions. Um, have things actually fit together that one output is compatible with the other program. Um, these are all things that are kind of hidden and I didn't put them all in my pipeline. Um, I just did the big steps, but you know, they're in between each step, there are like five tiny steps. And then of course I have to um, quality check every step because just doing it is useless if you don't know if you're doing it well. So uh, I always have to run some quality tests which I will do once we do the big, big test, um, which will take me two weeks to run, or the computer two weeks. Um, I'll send it off and I'll leave it for two weeks and then I hope um, it does well. And then we can, uh, and then I can tell you if it, uh, how well it does with uh, actually detecting animals when there are animals there and what kind of mistakes it makes. Um, yeah, does, yeah, but this is an important point. So just, um, just because it does well doesn't actually mean it's a good model mm -hmm. um, with this simple test. All models um, are wrong, some are useful. That's the yeah. thing. And even here, like being able to discard 80% of your images saying that there's nothing in there is, is already a big help. Right? Yeah. In the end, if, if, you, if you have a, a, a student, like a master's student, that has to go through all of these images and classify them, um, giving him 100,000 to do or giving him 20,000 to do um, 
with pre-sorting by some algorithm is it's going to make a massive amount of difference of course yeah even having just like even having some of these steps is already a huge improvement yeah. so um yeah i don't think uh saying like oh it's completely useless until we get over this 96 percent even um as i said before we have the top one accuracy and the top five accuracy even if you have, um, for example, you have a model and then it outputs to a person the top five guesses. Um, and as we saw before, like the top five guesses are usually have a pretty much high, have a pretty high percentage. Um, even that would increase the speed because it could be like, oh, I think it's one of these five. And then you click the one that's right. Um, and uh, my professor thought of doing like a, Something's pretty funny, like a, a animal Tinder kind of. So you have this algorithm, and it shows you the image, and then it gives you the top one, um, the top one guess. And then you can swipe right to say, oh yes, that's the right guess, and give that information back to the uh, uh, the model so it can learn. Or you swipe left, and it's the wrong guess, and then it can give you the top five guesses, and then you can pick from there, and it can learn. Or it's like, oh no, you were wrong completely. So that's also a point where you can see, like, we can use it to uh, kind of do some steps so that, um, but we just validate it and it's learning through validation. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Those are also ideas that we have. So it's not just all done with this and we're not um, saying, like, it, if, yeah, we can still do part of the work, but the amount of work that is happening now where everything is manual is just not smart to do. I'm waiting for the first cage trap pictures to appear when I log into my email saying click the mini deer uh, to continue right now yeah. you have all of these training sets for like self-driving cars where you have to click all of the like stop signs or click all of the bicyclists right and that's just to train like Tesla's new vehicles and all of these things because that's what yeah. they're using it for. Um, so, but good. you're gonna have nightmares about find the mini deer and you're like, this picture is black. No, <laughs> yeah. There is no it. mini deer in this picture. Well, that should be an option, <laughs> right? All right, perfect. All right. Hey, mate, thank you so much for for being yeah, here. Um, if there's no more questions, then um, we'll do a short break, um, and um, I will be back in like 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then uh, we'll continue with the real part of the lecture, um, which is, I totally forgot. I'm so thinking about machine learning at the moment. Um, standards for analysis. Um, so a lot yeah. less I exciting mean... than cool images of deer and, and, and porcupines and stuff, but. Uh, uh, and I'll just, uh, I can still read the chat later. So even if you have questions to my presentation during the lecture, I can still read it. Yeah. Yeah. And of um, course, if you're on YouTube and you're watching this in five years, then, uh, just ask a question on the YouTube and I will send it to Amy in the future <laughs> and then she can uh, answer it in five years. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so thanks for watching. Okay. It's been a long movie, one and a half hours. So Goodbye. that's good. Um, thank you, Amy, so much. And, <laughs> thank um, you. I will see you guys after the break then so enjoy the break i think the first break is what did i select i selected another animal um wombats i think so i will see you guys in uh, 15 minutes and enjoy the wombats um i think i hope all right so be right back <laughs> 